I'm going to go ahead and take that. Um, the Albany County Clerk's Office, as Susan said, has supplied sample ballots for us and the maps, and, and be sure you do look at those. You also, if you're a registered voter, should have gotten a voter registration card in the last six months. They were mailed out, and that says if you saved your little card, it tells you what precinct you're in, your ward, all of that information on there. Um, due to the redistricting, um, they have changed the wards uh, and the boundaries, so you may not be voting in the same place, and you may not be voting for the same people you have voted for in the past. Um, the League of Women Voters and the uh, Daily, uh, the League of Women Voters and the Laramie Daily Boomerang will be again publishing our voter guide. This will come out on August 12th in the newspaper, and that will have um, the responses of the question, the, to the questions that we supply to all the candidates for all the races will be in there. And we will do another voter guide in advance of the general election as well. And the voter guide is also published on the League's uh, website right now. So you can go in and link to that. And if you want our website, come see me afterwards. I've got the, the web address for that. And at this time, I'd like to give an opportunity for any other candidates that might be here tonight um, to in briefly introduce yourself, if you'd like to, or any other races that are going on. I'm Shelley Teller, and I'm running for county commissioner uh, in the Republican Party. I'm Tony Mendoza, and I'm running for House of 245 in the Democratic Party. candidates running for vacancies in three city council wards and with our new ward system all the wards have two seats now and in this election wards one and two have two vacant seats and ward one has one vacant seat so what that ends up meaning is that the top four vote getters in the primary in wards one and two are going to move on into the general election and the top two vote getters in ward three will move on to the general election so all three wards are considered contested races because we have more candidates than, than the number of positions that move on into the general election. Um, and we do have two candidates that are not here tonight. Um, Harold Bernard, who didn't, I'm, I'm not sure I didn't hear from him. I did originally said he would be here. Todd Yost, who is running in ward, um, it's ward three, sure. right? It, it called me today and said he was not going to be able to make it. And so questions for these candidates are to be written down and submitted at any time during the forum. That's what the slips of paper, someone had just asked me, there are slips of paper, they're actually the old library card catalog cards. <laughs> don't use them anymore. So don't use them anymore, so you can look and see what the selection of books are at the library. <laughs> Some of them may have been cold by now. Um, your questions are to be addressed to the position, in this case to city council, and not to a particular candidate. And then each candidate will have a chance to answer each question. They have 90 seconds to respond to the questions. And we do have a timekeeper. timekeeper. <laughs> and she will give you an indication of when you are coming, a yellow caution sign when you're clo coming close to your 90 seconds, and a stop sign when you are done with your 90 seconds. Um, and, if, and when you do have a question, just kind of raise it up in the air, and we have lead members here who will come and collect them, and we'll give them to our moderator. The last 20 or 30 minutes or so of the forum, we will um, turn over to just general informal conversation. Um, with the audience um, candidates, so you can chat. I was thinking the room is kind of tight. Typically in the library, we have to stack the chairs. You might kind of help by pulling chairs off to the side a little bit if you need more room to mingle. We'll um, need to um, set up before we leave. Yeah, to I, the table I think the lead members we can take care of that. Okay. Usually we have an amplification system, but because we're not at the library, we didn't cart it over here. So I, it is a small space and it has fairly good acoustics, but I would remind candidates to speak loudly, clearly, distinctly. And you don't have to remember to pass the microphone, though, <laughs> since there is no microphone. Um, and now I'm going to turn things over to our moderator. Uh, we have Dr. Steve Smutko, who is with the university here tonight to moderate. 
He is Wyoming's Spicer Chair in Collaborative Practice and a Professor in the Department of Agriculture and Applied Economics and also with the Environment and Natural Resources Program. So welcome to Good evening. Um, so my role is fairly simple. Um, I will be accepting questions that will be gathered uh, by uh, uh, members of the League and others. And um, I'll be asking them in turn to the candidates. I'm going to try to mix it up so it's not always the same candidate following the same candidate. Um, so I'll work on that. Um, and right now I do have a, a, a set of questions that have already been handed in, but as, as we go through the questions and if you've got more or if something sparks a question for you, write it down, hold it up, and we'll get it uh, in the pile. Now, um, I was attempting to organize by subject, but I thought uh, I could mix it up a little bit. We've got a lot of questions about uh, uh, offer for protection. I won't ask all of those in the same place, but I'll mix it up a little bit. Um, and I, and um, as we've already heard, uh, the candidates are not to start with a, a statement. It's simply an introduction of, uh, you know, your, your name, your, and uh, your political party in the office that you're seeking. Not, not oh, no party, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is city council. Your office, your ward. Um, and so we'll start with that. Uh, and I will just go, I'll start with uh, Mr. Blaylock. My name is Matthew Blaylock. I'm running for city council board one. I'm Vicki Henry, and I'm running for city council board one. I'm Brian Legendre, and I'm running for ward one as well. I'm Eric Mulvar, and I'm running for City Council in Ward 1. My name is Paul Weaver, and I'm running for City Council in Ward 1. My name is Guillermo Pizuela. I'm running for City Council in Ward 2. Please call me Bill. <laughs> Hi. Uh, sorry. If you want to go, you can. <laughs> I'm Scott Molner, and I represent Ward 4 currently. I am running for City Council, though now in Ward 2. Hi. I'm Jane Pierce, Ward 2. Joe Shumway, running for City Council in Ward 2. Carl McCracken, running for City Council, Ward 1. I'm Rebecca Riley, and do call me Becky, uh, and I'm running for City Council in Ward 3. Okay. Joe Vitale, I'm running for re-election, representing Ward 3. All right. Well, I'm going to start out with some questions. Uh, this one, these are, I think, uh, I'll start with some fairly general questions, and uh, then we'll get down to some more specifics. And I'm going to start... Um, in alphabetical order, so it would be Mr. Bill. Um, Mr. Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't connect. Um, what is, how do you pronounce your last name? Bruce Bruce Webb. Okay. So, Mr. Bruce Webb. Uh, I'll start with you, and then we'll proceed to your left, and then come around and end with Mr. Weaver. So, the first question is Is growth a means or an end? And if a means, to what end? <laughs> the thought in that terms is too academic. It's, it's growth is what happens. I mean, we are in a community that has continued to experience growth my entire life here in this town. Um, responsible growth, I think, would be something to consider, right? Um, A means to an end, no, no. Growth is what happens organically in a community. Growth is what happens when we address issues head on and deal with each other as members of the community. Uh, as far as just having ideas, that's fine. It's fine to have grand ideas. It's a fine thing to build. But we live here together in the meantime. And I think that there should be no growth that isn't take into consideration the folks that are actually there, the people who are actually living here. It's not, it's not an abstract term. It's not an abstract thing. It's, it's an organic place of where we are. And where we go. All right, thank you. We'll move on to uh, Mr. Moore. Thank you. I guess the way that I've always viewed the growth and development of cities is that a city either is growing or it's dying. There's really only two, two things that can happen. Again, it is organic. It's 
Bill said. And I've always looked at it as being very important to have planned growth. You, city design, city planning is an incredibly important thing. And that, that as we move forward into the future, my goal has always been to help Laramie grow in a planned and logical fashion so that any business that wants to come in, any business that would like to develop more jobs would have that opportunity within the city of Laramie. I see things that happen in other communities where growth occurs that don't seem to be planned. And those types of things would concern me. And on the council, I have always worked to try to have an idea of what we're doing and why we're doing it. I'm very, very pro-planning. And so if you look at the way I vote, if you look at the way I've done things on council, I've always moved towards smart growth, but I do believe growth is important and we have to grow as a city in order to, in order to survive. Thank you. All right, Ms. Pierce. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add um, to that. I think that growth obviously is important. It happens. Um, I just think it does have to be planned, and I, I guess I'm just going to agree with what my colleague has, has said. I think we need to plan our growth. All right, Mr. Shumlin. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank the, the women voters for inviting us here. This is a great opportunity for us to share ideas. Um, when I moved here in the late 1970s, the population in Laramie was about 25,000, and now we're over 30,000, and, and obviously our growth is not, is not rapid, but it's, it's been a real positive growth for the city. I watch the students also, and the, the student growth has been something that's been positive. The one thing I want to have happen is I want to have good jobs stay here with the development of the technology center and also the potentials for the data center and things like that. We're giving opportunities to keep them here, which I think is a great thing for us to do. Also, I'm very proud of the opportunity we now have to have things that attract and retain people like the rec center. And uh, I, I love Laramie and I love the opportunity for people to come here and say this is a great place not only to, to have a good job, but also a good place for a student or a family to put in their roots and stay here. And so I want to make sure that we have not only smart growth, but also positive growth and a community that we can all be proud of. All right, thank you. Mr. McCracken. Um, you know, when it comes to growth, it's going to happen. I agree with one of the previous people that it either happens or you die. Uh, a lot of communities in Wyoming that's happened to. Um, but as far as the growth goes, we have to make sure we're not preventing growth. And one way to prevent growth is to expect the same things here in a town of 30,000, 32,000, as they do in Cheyenne, in a town of 70,000, counting the buffer area, or Fort Collins, 160,000, or Loveland or Longmont or something like that. We, we are not those towns. Uh, we have the lowest per capita sales tax collections of any community within the state of Wyoming on a per capita basis, but the students are part of the reason for that, and the best things we have for growth, and for long-term growth, uh, one of the previous counselors mentioned, and I fully support um, any type of data center or economic development, um, but we have to make sure that this is affordable because it's very tough for people in this community when we put two higher standards on them that they cannot afford to build or have projects to occur at this time. All right, Ms. Riding. Well, I think there's a couple of components to growth. Uh, growth, obviously, on an economic com component, but I also think you need to look at the community as a whole. Um, and I think sometimes as uh, we progress in growth, we have to look at the economics, we have to look at what the community is actually composed of. And right now, I think we're in a, in a very interesting dichotomy. I think we have both youth in the sense of students, um, and then we have um, a lot of people who are close to retirement or are in that retirement age bracket. And growth right now for economic development is lacking. I don't think um, our youth really have that option daughter who basically had to leave the community because there was not a job here. Uh, I think we need to be looking more on the realm of bringing in 
the kind of economic growth, the kinds of job opportunities that we have. Um, stopping that particular component in our community um, has been something that I've witnessed in the past. Um, I'd like to see that stop. Um, on the next component, though, I think we need to be looking at community. We need to figure out what our community needs and also be very aware that we can't just have growth for the sake of growth. We need to find the whole component. Right. Thank you. Mr. Bradshaw. Thank you, and I'd like to also thank the legal women voters for this opportunity. And also a lot of hard work putting this together. Um, Prior to coming to Laramie after graduating, going back to Michigan, I spent 15 years as a city official, of which I spent the majority of my time, uh, a lot of my time, with community development. Uh, there was a different climate and a different situation there that is presented here. Growth, to me, is a result of building blocks you know, to an expected result that changes with community needs. You know, it should be compatible and consistent with the community's identity. We are Laramie, Wyoming. Our strength is education. Uh, I think 95% of the people in Laramie have at least a high school education. Uh, we have a major university here that doesn't play second chair to anybody. Uh, we have opportunities to co-op with them, and we have been working with them. Uh, there are some good development opportunities on the horizon that, that are in the hopper and will be coming forth. So uh, growth needs to be organized and it needs to be compatible with the needs of the community and fit the community's identity. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll move around the table to Mr. Bay. There's not much I can add, as all my colleagues have said. Growth has to happen. There is no end to growth. Growth has to happen, happen in jobs, but it also has to happen in youth programs and stuff like that because the youth are our future. They're what we're going to grow to be, what they do later. So we need to get jobs here today to keep the youth here tomorrow because Laramie does have a lot of people come and they leave because there is not jobs here that people feel they can do. I'm trying to think of a proper word to say that. Um, so growth has to happen more than just jobs. It has to happen with youth also, because the youth is what those eight to fifteen year olds are going to be the one running for city council and voting ten years down the line. So we need to grow the programs for youth and the jobs for them for the future. All Thank right. you, Ms. Henry. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, all these people have said what I would say as well, and that is that we've got to have growth, and we do have growth even if it's slow, and being on the Laramie Planning Commission, I can see the things that come before us, the developments that are happening, the housing developments, and I think it's really important for everyone to be aware of the, our growth and for the communities where the growth is taking place to be able to know about the developments that are going on so that they can, so that we can all harmonize as uh, Bill said earlier. And that's what I have to say. All right, thank you. And moving on to Mr. LeJambre. Well, uh, I came here 14 years ago as a student. Uh, I was one of the lucky ones that was able to find a job here and start a career here in Laramie. Um, since that time, I've seen Laramie grow leaps and bounds. And while I enjoy having uh, chilies and you know some nice hotels and people come and visit, that can't be the only gro uh, growth that we have here in our community. Um, the university is a major part of our community, and you know we probably wouldn't be where we are without it but we have to make sure that there's a balance in the growth that we have and make sure that Laramie is an attractive place to, for other companies to come in and set up shop and balance out our uh, local economy and make sure that we have those good paying jobs and not just rely on the service industry, so to speak, and rely on the university because 
like I said, they have cuts coming up here uh, this next year, 8%. We can't put all our eggs in one basket. And as city council, we need to make sure we're prepared for that growth that comes. To make sure that the infrastructure is laid out to support all the new people coming in and businesses that would want to come to our community. And as long as we have that balance and we're taking that all into consideration and do it responsibly, then we should be in a good place. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Well, thank you, and thanks to the League of Women Voters for, for holding this forum. I think it's great to get everybody here and, and get everybody talking among the community and have those ideas be able to radiate out into the community. Um, I think that certainly uh, growth for its own sake is, is not uh, the goal here. I think growth is, is a means to the end, and, and the means to the end is, uh, is quality of life. I think in terms of the kinds of growth that we could see, I'm running on a plat platform of smart growth. I'm working really hard. I look to the south, to Colorado. I see the, the urban sprawl that's out in the plains with those uh, subdivisions that all look the same, like little boxes. We don't need that here in Laramie. We need to focus our effort in the core of the town. We need to have uh, growth that honors both progressive ideals and conservative <coughs> ideals. Progressive in terms of what kind of progress do you want? What kind of growth is going to lead to the kind of community that is going to attract more qualified people, that's going to attract more businesses, that's going to make the residents here want to stay longer. What kind of things here in Laramie are the things that we need to conserve? What are the, is it the small town feel? I think it is. I think the wonderful part of Laramie is we have a small town appeal, we have a wonderful historic downtown, we have beautiful neighborhoods with lots of trees. This is the kind of growth that we need. The job of a city council and a competent government is to guide that growth to make sure that we don't have uncontrolled growth that ends up with cheap, tacky results that the, the residents that move in can't enjoy their neighborhoods. We want neighborhoods where everyone feels happy and at home. All right, thank you. And uh, Mr. Weaver. Thank you. On that? Sure. Let me close this quickly. <laughs> Closing the curtain on me already. <laughs> okay. Um, Taking you out of the spotlight. Yeah. I think it's appropriate for all the candidates to, to say a thank you to the League of Women Voters for organizing and promoting these events. It's a valuable public service and I mean, we're all grateful for it. I want to answer this question by paraphrasing um, Wyoming's only three-term governor because I think the answer that he gave to a question very similar to this still rings true. And it echoes some of the comments we've already heard and that's that growth is inevitable. You're going to have growth in a community, at least a healthy community. But uh, where we do have a role to play and where we do have a choice as a community is whether or not we have growth on our terms. And I think the way to get growth on our terms in Laramie is to have meaningful input from the people that live here when the city council goes through its policy making process and its deliberations to really include those opinions and those views about what makes this a valuable community become an integral part of the policy making process before we make those decisions about what kind of growth we're going to have or where the growth is going to go. It's got to be coming from a channel of meaningful citizen input in the policy making process. And I think that uh, city council folks do have a responsibility to guide development, but I think first and foremost, they have a responsibility to interact with the constituency and make sure that the views that are held by those individuals are represented on the council. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so I'm going to uh, move to some questions related to infrastructure and infrastructure planning. And I have two questions that I've found so far related to that. And I'm going to bundle the two questions together. I think they're, uh, they're pretty close to one another. Um, so um, the question that I'll start with uh, is um, what criteria would you use in prioritizing capital projects for the city. So what criteria would you use? And I'm going to follow that on is what would you do with respect to replacing and improving infrastructure such as water and sewer? So a fairly general question about infrastructure planning and then a more specific question about what would you do about replacing infrastructure. And I'm going to start then uh, at the um, I'll randomly choose Joe Shumway to start, and then we're going to come back around uh, again uh, to the candidates left. So, Mr. Shumway. Okay, this is a <clears throat> huge item that the City Council works with every, every time we meet infrastructure because it's so important to have a healthy community. 
first of all, I think when we're looking for prioritizing and the, and the criteria that we want to find to prioritize what we have to look at, the example that we had in this past five years was looking at the number of water breaks that we had. It went from an average of 30 to 40 a year up to a, over 150. It became critical. We knew we had to do something to, to fix that. And so that became a real driving force for the council to work on that. We have a plan. That we had a consultant that came in called Red Oak that gave us some guiding principles on how to correct that. The discouraging part was we were looking at huge increases. In fact, for the years 2012, 13, 14, and 15, we were looking at 19% increases in the, in the water fees going to, to the utility fees to the customers, and that was unacceptable. And so what we did is we worked hard. The community jumped in. They did their part, passing the sixth cent. That lowered some of the rates. We got a lot of, of uh, <clears throat> contributions from the state. And federal things lowered it down to 2.5%, and an extra half percent if we can get some grants and things like that. Now another thing we need to look at is another infrastructure problem that's really serious in this community, and that's the streets, the number of potholes, how manageable the streets are. As you can tell, there's been a lot of street closures, that, and, and it's time for us to get that under control also. All right, thank you. So I'll move to uh, Mr. McCracken. Um, as a street prioritization, I would say, well, of course, you have to do the worst first, and then, of course, whatever's the smart project second. Because a lot of these projects, they tie into other projects that are just across the road, you know, new development, something like that. So you need to get the infrastructure under the uh, 30th of grant. Everything's been replaced underground. So it's not going to have to be replaced again within the next, hopefully, 50 years. Uh, because they oversized it, they did, they took care of everything. Uh, and then third, of course, grants. Anytime you can get some uh, state money, and the state has been very generous, and with $3-plus um, natural gas, hopefully the uh, worst-case scenarios won't happen, and we'll be able to continue getting grants. Um, some of the things we've done, besides what you've seen, what Joe talked about with the 19, 12, 7, and 3, because that was projected to be four years and 19%, uh, the water coming out of the Laramie River now comes out the pipe. And that originally was going to be, um, I believe it was about seven and a half million, which I think two and a half was a loan, or it was a grant, and five was a loan. By the time we got done, it was five million grant and two and a half loan, but it doubled the amount of water out of the Laramie River that goes to the water treatment plant because the water was going into the canal and sinking into the dirt. And we have to measure it from the point at which it comes out of the river. So we basically have doubled the amount of water available from the river. Right. I think I'm going to approach this in just a little bit different way. Um, I think first and foremost, we have to have a master plan. Um, and I think that master plan has to be well disseminated. Um, I think the Red Oak material is, um, is interesting reading. Um, and it is, it, I don't have the advantage of having met with Red Oak and so on and so forth. That master plan, as far as, as the water process goes, I think is, is more than adequate. I, I think it was a good consultant, um, and I think we need to be real aware that sometimes we have to trust our consultants. Um, the second piece of that, however, is specifically addressed to the water. Um, I think we also need to be looking at the environmental issues that go along with that. Um, we have a treatment facility that we've had to upgrade. We're going to have to upgrade it again, if I understand it correctly. Um, I think we need to look at that master plan, redo the master plan if we need to, and, and go on and take our process the rest of the way through. It also has to be cost effective. And we have to pay for our utilities. Um, that is, that is a, a function of life. But first and foremost, we have to have a really good solid plan. If that happens to be something that Red Oak um, came up with, that's fine. Um, and I think the plan that we have right now in place to replace some of the older <coughs> pipes and so on and so forth, I think needs to be continued. All right, thank you. Mr. Lincoln. Thank you. Um, those of us that are on council and sitting here tonight uh, probably have an advantage in that we have been part of that Red Oak study from its inception. And um, it is a master plan. I, I think it's been well thought out. It's been prioritized based on uh, age of the infrastructure, based on the uh, 
frequency of water, line breaks, and so forth. And, and, and it's a 10-year plan that we have implemented, and we have been lucky through uh, additional grants and the six cent sales tax and capital improvements money. First year, I think we spent around $33 million, and this year, I think we're scheduled to spend over $20 million. The initial plan was about an $85 to $100 million program. I think we should be looking at the next 10 years. We should be looking at the priority of what areas of town. This also encompasses not only the redevelopment, but also the new development in the areas, um, perimeter areas and undeveloped areas to allow for, for growth. I think we also should be looking and planning ahead for our new water and wastewater treatment plant as this community grows. Uh, we have facilities are getting up there in age. And as we grow, I don't think our facility in Harmony is going to be able to take care of the water treatment for the whole community. And we should be putting money into reserve accounts now uh, for that need. Okay, thank you, Mr. Patel. All right, moving on to Mr. Bayon. The first thing we need to do is if any emergency work that needs to be done. We cannot put an emergency work off. So even with mesh plan in place, water line breaks, you've got to go take care of it. And then you've got to prioritize through the city council and through the citizens of Laramie, see what the citizens of Laramie want, and use their feedback to see what needs to be done. Because even with the master plan, there are some things that citizens see that the five, six, seven, nine members of the city council do not see because they're in their neighborhoods. So you've always got to get feedback from the citizens. Beyond that, I don't have too much more to say on it because I see, I see things in town that need to be done. One of the things I see in front of Linford Elementary School, it's the only school in town that does not have four paved roads around it. And my kids go to Linford, you get out and you get out in mud puddles. So that would be one of those first things that I would say hey, needs to be done. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Ms. Henry. Um, I agree that um, the number one priority would be public safety. So when we talk about our water pipes and our wastewater pipes breaking or if they're too small, they all need to be oversized for, to plan for our future development. And um, I was just thinking about the Linford School and thinking about how true that is, that it is our only school in Laramie that doesn't even have paved streets around it. And that's, that's just not fair. It may be that the residents of West Laramie didn't choose to have their streets paved or for whatever reason, but the school kids, they need, they need to have some pavement around their school. Um, so public safety, I think, and um, Public input and also comfort, you know, our the and our, our curbs that have been the streets that were built many years ago and the curbs are all now shifted and they're they're falling off and the water isn't draining properly into the gutters, into the the sewers and storm sewers that take it to the rivers. So yeah, there's a lot that needs to be done around here. I don't know how to fund it, though. All right, thank you. Mr. Bushan. Well, um, obviously, you can't get past emergency situations and uh, fixing things if there's a full pipe or a massive bottle in the middle of the ground. Um, I like the fact that at the 30th and Grand intersection, uh, like Mr. Patel was saying, that they oversized those pipes to accommodate for future growth in that area. Um, we obviously need to maintain uh, the infrastructure that we do have. I personally enjoy very much having running water in my house, so uh, making sure that we have that constantly and fixing things that are currently a problem and just going from the oldest step to the new step before we consider any additional growth and building extra things beyond that. Um, as far as master plan, I have not been privy to that and I have not seen that, but as long as we're planning for uh, additional treatment and additional sewage services. Um, I know that 
our system had been subject to neglect for quite a while, which uh, really brought on the big increases that we've had in our uh, water prices for the last four years. And if we got it under control, like they say we have, then hopefully we can keep it reasonable while maintaining what we have in our water system. Thanks. All right, Mr. Mulder. Thank you. And, you know, infrastructure is the backbone of a city. And without a solid infrastructure system, the city cannot grow and function. When I came on to city council four years ago, there had been decades long neglect of our water and sewer and infrastructure. And the citizens knew it because they were having line breaks all over the city. The city planners and the city staff knew it because they were spending all their time break to break to break and spending all their money on emergency repairs. There was no money to rebuild the pipes that were crumbling out of sheer age. And so as a result, listening to those citizen surveys where the majority of the citizens, the vast majority of the citizens said, focus on infrastructure. This council has been very strong in going forward and, and getting this Red Oak study in place, which is a 10-year kind of Apollo program for water and sewer infrastructure. And what this is going to do is this is going to be, we're in year four of a 10-year plan, and it's going to totally overhaul our infrastructure so that at the end of that 10 years, we can have an infrastructure system that is sound and ready to move forward where we only have to replace 2% per year. Now, if you raise the amount of money you're spending on infrastructure, you have to raise the water rates too. One of my main focuses has been how do we make this less of a burden on the ratepayers? I encouraged our city staff to go ahead and seek those shovel-ready infrastructure programs, and they did a fantastic job, and that reduced our water rates. I got our uh, sewer rates to be reformed, and it took a dollar a month off of every single resident's sewer bill by making those fairer among different classes. So I think that's the way that we have to proceed forward to provide as much uh, quality service for our citizens at the fairest possible cost. All right, Mr. Weaver. Uh, thank you. I think uh, you've heard from the city members of the council and the candidates here something that's true and it's unfortunate, but um, a lot of the circumstances surrounding infrastructure repair, I mean, those, those priorities have developed on their own and anything that's going to affect uh, public safety is obviously going to be a priority. I think beyond that, you know, I think we've heard other comments that I also agree with that we need to be looking at things that are going to foster a positive environment in the long term for Laramie. But something I haven't heard that I want to add too that I think should be a component of these discussions is an effort to minimize the inconvenience to the residents of Laramie during these infrastructure repair issues to the extent that it's possible. I understand these circumstances do dictate, you know, themselves, but if we can make a better effort to do that, I think that's something I would support. I think it's something a lot of people in Laramie would support. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Brizuela. Criteria. Safety. Livability. In that order. Um, you have to have a safe environment. Free from that reduce liability issues, among other things. Take care of things that makes the residents safe first. Uh, livability. I had a number of friends of mine that have problems with the sewers. Back then, they're being upgraded now, thank goodness. Where we back up, it's just the nature of the sewers. That's a livability issue. Those kind of infrastructures need to be addressed. Um, another, I would like to go back to, to safety for a moment, though. And here's one thing that hasn't been heard. That is, maybe it's not considered necessarily infrastructure, but the trees, our beloved trees that we have in our community, our tree, our tree area. Well, a number of those trees are well along in their life cycle. A number of those are out in the parking, which I understand is city responsibility. Now, uh, in terms of safety, there's nothing that'll kill you quicker than a tree falling on you or a branch. It's, I mean, it's, and not to mention the liability issues. I think there should be some effort put into looking into getting these trees adequately trimmed. I've already, just this year, I've done four. There's one I have to take almost 60% of the entire tree out so that we could have the rest to grow. Other ones dead to the core, rotten, had to go. Um, I think we're going to run into liability issues, things falling on people and on houses that can't deal with that. I think that's an infrastructure thing to look at. Uh, the viaduct is not getting any younger, folks. It's that, that poor thing. I love it. I love the Clark Street viaduct, and it's going to be moving over to my street, moving over to my street on Harney. And I just assume not have the extra, extra traffic, but I do think we need to have a new structure there as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Bruce Wayne. All right, moving on to Mr. Mulder. Thank you. When you look at what the city council has done over the, over the past several years since I've been on council, you'll notice that what we did really was take a system 
and triage it. We had a system that was in a relative state of disrepair and hadn't had many um, conveniences added to it because of a lack of, of rate increases. We had been stagnant on rates for a long time. And as a council, we have moved forward with a plan. You'll hear about the Red Oak plan. We function on a 10-year plan. We always have a, a floating 10-year plan for all of our infrastructure needs. And we always have to triage those types of, of infrastructure needs. We deal with the worst first, you deal with the public safety issues first, and then you move forward and do the other things that will enhance and benefit the city and allow smart growth again. Always you're going to hear me talk about planning, and I think that we have to do planning for both the infrastructure and the funding. Our goal on council, my goal on council, is always to try to find alternative sources for funding that don't come out of the pockets of the citizen. We can't always do that. You have seen increases in, in, in rates, but we always strive to keep those to a minimum when we're looking at these infrastructure projects. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Ms. Pierce, you have the last word on infrastructure, right? Yeah, thank you. Um, certainly we disagree with safety and, and the plan uh, to move forward. I guess just as a citizen of Laramie, I think it's sad that we have to triage. I'm sorry, I just think we should be a little more organized and a little more forward-looking so that it's not always a situation of triage. Um, with that said, I think we should think about things like um, we have water rates that I, in my opinion, you know, I can't really afford to water my grass. So I think we should think about having a system where those that can afford perhaps could pay a little more, you know, or possibly have conservation plans, you know, regarding our water. I think it's ridiculous to be watering the, the pavement and and the sides of buildings. I just think we need to really take care and conserve the ER water. All right. Um, now I'm going to move to um, a more very specific question. Um, and I'll start with Mr. Batal and we'll continue in the leftward motion here, to each candidate on your left. Uh, so this question concerns uh, the old high school, or the high school. <laughs> Still there. Um, what would you think of turning the high school, the old high school, uh, land into a city park once the new high school is built? Well, I'll tell you, you're, you're asking an old former Parks and Recreation Director to not support a park. <laughs> Uh, I um, we had the uh, presentation on a preliminary uh, result so far on our master plan for parks, trees, and open space. Uh, there is a deficiency projected, I think, around 148 acres of parkland for Laramie. Uh, community I was in about comparable in size of Laramie. I had 525 <coughs> usable acres uh, plus a 26 mile bike trail. Here um, I think we're around 125 usable acres. I think there are plans for that parkland to house a new elementary school. Uh, I think that's in the master plan of the school district. But schools and elementary schools can be compatible also to parkland. They can have a multiple use. So I think working with the school district on the playground area and so forth, you could incorporate some open space parkland needs there for that neighborhood. All right, thank you. Mr. Blaylock. Maybe not the whole area it needs to be a park, but I I'm as I said, I am completely into youth programs and stuff like that. It's one of my big things. So using that as a park, I have no problems with it. But I don't think you have to use the whole area as a park. Parks can be the cornerstone of our community. And if we had the more parks we have, the prettier the community looks. The better the community looks, 
the more people want to come here. The more people that want to come here, the more tax, the more tourist dollars are spent, the more money we bring into this community. So I would be all for bringing that area to a park, and if we had to use part of it for an elementary school, I'd be fine with that too. But the parks can be the cornerstone of our community and make this community a thriving community. Thank you. All right, Ms. Henry. Um, I think that that would require demolition of that high school, and I think that might be a little bit wasteful. I mean, it, there is a, a nice building. It's been there a long time, and I'm sure that it needs a little bit of rehab, possibly. But, um, and we are deficient in parks, and that is a specific area where we need more parks. So perhaps the football field, the track field, all that area could become a park, and we could reuse that building. It could be um, a way to get a new business in here. Maybe somebody needs a very large building like that that would they could remodel and use for um, business development. I really, but it, is, it would be good to have part of that as a park because we are deficient in parks in that area. Even though Levante is right down the street, that's not enough for the population in the area. All right, thank you. Mr. Lejeune. Well, I would need to know more about the situation. Uh, what lifespan is left on that building? Um, what would be the cost of getting rid of that building and demolishing the stadium? Um, would there be any other <coughs> things that the city could use that for to put in that building? Uh, it could be dual purpose. Um, Levante is a couple blocks away. Do we need a park that's that big right there? And if they decide that they want something like that, and they need something on Reynolds there, then, and it was cost effective, it wasn't a waste of that building, then that would be something I would support. But that's a big chunk of land sitting right there, and if it could be used for something beneficial to the city besides just park, then I'd like to hear some options on that as well. All right, Mr. Moore. Well, certainly in terms of quality of life, parks rank right up at the very top in terms of improving quality of life for residents. And not only do they increase the value of the neighboring residences and neighboring neighborhoods, but they also increase the ability of those residents to come in and have a quality, high quality of life and have access to the type of, of, um, of amenities that, that will have them enjoy a full and meaningful life here in Laramie. Now, that part of the city, the north central part of the city, is poor in parks. They don't have as many acres of park per resident as most other parts of the city. So that is a really a, a, a screaming need for having at least some of that footprint become a, a, an open space or a park. And, you know, on the other hand, when you look at the high school structure, um, I think you look at the building, the building is not particularly historical, the building is not very efficient, and it is not very easy to repurpose. And whereas I have been the leading voice for repurposing buildings like the Lincoln Center and the Civic Center to save their historic uh, availability and create these kind of nucleuses for community activities, I'm not sure that the high school is a great candidate for that, as large and barn-like as it is. So uh, this piece of open space, this piece of open land that's going to become available, they don't make that anymore in the middle of cities. So we need to think very carefully about whether we want to recommit that to other buildings or whether maybe open space or some combination use is the best use. All right, thank you. Mr. Weaver. Thank you. Um, that's an interesting question, and I think most people in Laramie would be supportive of having more park space in the city, but the first thing that comes to my mind is whether or not Albany County School District might have something in mind for the use of that facility yeah. after a steep condition. <laughs> There's a constant need for, for space, for their operations. So I think that's something that we'd need to uh, probably take a look at before we move any further. I mean, they're, they're out of room as it is using uh, decommissioned schools for you know, schools they need room for their own <coughs> operations that said people support parks I like parks we all do they do help quality of life thank you all right mr. Bourgeois. well I don't suppose I'd mind so much if there was a park there on the other hand I think my dad's gonna come out for a bit we have a we use an old 1956 truck that we use to haul saw in we have a 1967 stump grinder that we still use I'm not quite as anxious to write off the structure, especially since I graduated from there. <laughs> I think maybe looking into it, there's a lot of value there. 
there's, there's value. There's value in that structure. Um, and there's a lot of land around it. You even out, out in the front, park already, out behind. I'd even suggest keeping the track. Have that be for community use. Soccer field, make a park. We'll put some trees, I'll plant them. <laughs> um, I love park space. I do. Um, my, my life is outdoors and in nature and, and seeing the trees, especially I love the trees. I love park space, but I, I, I wouldn't be so quick to write off that particular structure. All right, thank you. Mr. Mullen. I guess the, uh, Mr. Weaver stole my thunder because really the, the, uh, the determination by the Albany County School District number one of what that land will be repurposed for, if any, is really where all of this conversation has to start. Now that being said, I, I, I currently sit on our, our parks, trails, and, and open space committee that is developing a master plan. It, this group has been working on it for about a year for the city of Laramie. And as I've said every other time, I believe planning is huge. And so we are trying to plan where, what, how much, and why do we need these parks and, and, and how are we going to get there. And so as we move forward, I know that the northern part of the city of Laramie is deficient in parklands. Much of the city of Laramie is deficient in parklands, 75 to 150 acres, depending upon which experts' numbers you look at. But the, the question still is a bit premature, and, and I think we have to wait to see what happens with the Albany County School District in that area. We still don't have the new high school, and until we do, I'm not willing to give up the other building. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Ms. Pierce. I'd have to agree with that. I can't really add anything um, extra to that. Parks are great, obviously, but we need a place for the kids to go to school, so that's it. All right, thank you. Mr. Schumer. Thank you. I, I, I realize that the city is going to have some negotiating to do uh, for that property should we have a purpose for the city because it belongs to the Albany County School District number one, which has been stated. I think there's opportunities in several areas. One is obviously that the University of Wyoming or LCCC could negotiate to do some trades or whatever to obtain that land. I like the idea of putting an elementary school there. I like the idea of a city park going there. The one thing that I think that maybe we have an opportunity if the city should obtain it is we don't have a performing arts center. And that's, an op that's, a, that's a thought to, to look at. Also the city you know, has a, a, maybe a chance to, to do some, some work in, in having uh, facilities for uh, the, the city, for like a new city hall or something like that. Now, I would not support that at this time because I don't think the economy is right for that. But I do really believe that there's an opportunity in education to use that. I don't want to have it go to anything other than just a, 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 an anchor for the city for us to have something for education, uh, recreation or for the performing arts. All right, thank you. Mr. McCrack. Um, this is a tough one because we're not really to that stage yet because when we do get the money for the new high school and it gets built, yeah, excuse me, Phil knows what I'm saying. Um, the, um, then there will be a lot of discussions. Uh, you know, the rec center itself that we uh, currently have, the, the, uh, not the rec center, the uh, Tell me, Joe. What? <laughs> the old high school, Civic Center. Center. Civic Center, those uh, basketball courts in there are used a lot. There are certain aspects of the high school that would be very helpful and would almost be a park, almost be park like. Um, but what's going to end up happening, in my opinion, is one, the school district owns it. And they're going to have to come up with a joint powers board or a committee. Uh, the council will probably appoint two people, count the um, County commissioners will probably appoint a couple. The school district appoint a couple. Uh, there would be people from all over the community. But then they'd have to have meetings to find out what the public wanted, too. And quite frankly, they need to concentrate greatly on what the residents of that area want. Because they're the ones going to have to live with it. And more parks, yes, I'd like to have more parks. I, I personally think that track, it'd be such a, the track on the football field, 
Soccer, yes. Somebody said so. I didn't personally. I'm not into soccer, but there are people who are. Uh, <laughs> there can be quite a few games played on there. There's a large area behind it. Um, the area in between part of that parking lot probably may not be required anymore. Um, but it's going to be a community decision as a whole. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Ryan. Well, I think it's an interesting to be placed in this last position. I feel very feel for the rest of you. I've already <laughs> done that. Um, I would not support uh, using that particular, repurposing that particular building at this juncture um, or in the near future. The problem with repurposing a building like that, first and foremost, is, is the Albany County School District really wants that for a school site. Um, and there is a reason for that. It's in the middle of a, of a, a community area where we need that bigger elementary school there. Now, that is in, by the way, Ward 2. It's not in Ward 3, so I will now address Ward 3. Um, I, I really think that we are so underserved in Ward 3 for park processes um, in attending just one of the master plan meetings for parks and recreation. They are really working very hard. That community group is working extremely hard to try and, and do that. There are many more opportunities to the north of Indian Hills for parks. Um, I think the track, obviously, it would be nice to repurpose that or keep that in a place where we might be able to do that. But I think we're jumping the gun, and, and I really am very concerned about jumping that gun right now, especially, as Mr. Shumway said, in the economic issues that we've got right now within the city. All right. Um, I have two questions about public transportation. I'm going to bring it around this side. We'll start with uh, Mr. Mulvar on this. Um, these two questions I'll wrap into the same. Um, the, the first question uh, says, the county commission <clears throat> will shortly be considering a ballot uh, item for a half mil <clears throat> levy to support the Gem City Grand. Do you believe that the current transportation system serves your constituents? If not, what can or will you do on city council to optimize services for your ward? Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, what is your position on public transportation in Laramie? Well, I think public transportation is something that uh, at Laramie is just in its infancy in terms of experimenting with. And the Gem City Grand right now, uh, in terms of the citizen survey that's gone out, about 6% of the city is riding it, but more than 50% of, of the city residents say they want it and they want it to stay. And that shows me an intention to ride it or wanting to have it available to them at need. Now, I have myself ridden the Gem City Grand. Um, it has a fairly limited uh, service area, and I think that it would be a lot bigger of an asset to the community if there were more, um, more routes. In fact, I think that joining a route out to West Laramie and serving the West Side neighborhood would be something that would be a real asset instead of just having the downtown to Walmart trunk line. So, um, whereas I don't have a position on where the county commission ought to go in terms of the, the mill levy and the funding for that, that's something that I, you know, that I don't know well, and, uh, and so I'm not going to venture a position on that. I do think that that is something that in cities that have, uh, have experimented with successfully public transportation, it really has been something that has enhanced the quality of life of the residents and provided a lot of services. And I think certainly that PAT service that we also have, the Epson Center, needs not to be forgotten because that's also a very important um, service for our, many of our residents that need to be looked at. All right, thank you. Mr. Weaver. Uh, thank you very much. I, I definitely support public transportation. I think we have some challenges uh, with regard to the public transportation in, in Laramie and Alameda County. Um, certainly, the, uh, the service areas for the Gem City Grand right now aren't getting all of Laramie's population. They're not able to service all of them. I mean, I've been looking at that uh, through um, my role in, at my job, where I work with uh, you know a community center where we're trying to figure out ways to both get people over to our area and also to help folks in need get out of the area to access services and shopping and things like that that they need to do. I, there's room for improvement, dramatic room for improvement. The question is how would we pay for it? 
if, uh, as Mr. Molvar states, there are, are well over 50% of the people in, in the community that want to have public transportation, I suppose that they would be supportive of the mill levy to, to pay for it, but I think that we would have to find that out, and whether or not we'd be able to expand public transportation in Laramie and Albany County would depend on the willingness of the community to pay for it. And uh, that's not a decision that's made you know, by individual elected officials. It's a decision we would all need to make together. But I, I do support public transportation. I think we would benefit from, from more of it in Laramie. Thanks. All right. And we'll move on to Mr. Brizuela. There are a number of uh, things that are served by public transportation. Not only do you get to, get to go places, you get to not have your car there, which means there's less parking issues, which means there's less. It's, it's, what I see the issue that we have with this particular transit option that we have is that, yeah, we'd like to be downtown, and yeah, we'd like to be at Walmart, but nobody lives there. So we have to get to a place where we can actually get access to the bus to get going. Um, what I use is this, the, the university system. Right there, I can get my girls up, and we can get on the bus, and we can go down to Co Library and hang out down at the Union, and then head back. It's where we live. It's there. It's available for us to use. I think that's, I see a, not just a cost issue, but you have a place where you have, it's like getting over the hump. It's like it's going to, mm. if we could find additional funding for it, I'm not sure how, how anxious I'd be to, to hunt for money too much. Um, no. I think, I think it is important. I know we just got to go over the hump. It just has to be usable. It has to be usable. The trunk line, it's, it's, I think a lot more people would use it if it, if it hit them where they live. And I think it is important. I think there's a lot of, lot of birds you hit with that stone when you have good public transportation. But you have to have it. You have to get over the hump to where it's usable. And that would be the issue I'd look more into. I'm certainly in favor of supporting that. Certainly. All right, Mr. Mulner. I guess if you look at where we were just a couple of years ago, we didn't really have much of a public transportation system. Now we've got the demonstration project with the Albany County Transportation Authority and, and the, the Grand Avenue trunk line. And if you, if you look at that and the demand and the ridership, it appears that there is a need. And if you look at public transportation as a whole, I think it's a necessary thing in any city that's growing because you have a lot of individuals especially with students and aged folks that don't drive cars. It helps with congestion. It helps with accessibility. And it also helps businesses because you have the ability to get employees to locations where they may not go otherwise. And so I definitely support and, and voted for uh, the, the demonstration project with the, with the uh, Transportation Authority. When you look at what would I tell the county commissioners to do with a mill levy? I, I'm not going to touch that because that's the county commissioner's decision. I did, however, support putting some city money into the uh, public transit uh, demonstration project, and I support the city continuing to be involved in this project because I believe it's important. We have to provide transportation and accessibility for those folks that don't have it because it does help the city as a whole, both in transportation for shopping and for employees. Thank you. All right, thank you. Ms. Pierce. Yeah, absolutely. I think public transportation is, is really vital. I think we need to look for, uh, potentially look at grant dollars, uh, federal and state dollars to, to help with that project. Um, and it's obviously important to get people to and from work and to and from shopping facilities. And if if we have a system, we need to get to key locations in our community, which includes West Laramie and the Senior Center, and you know as far out as as Walmart. All right, thank you, Mr. Shum. From what I understand, 85 to 90 percent of the ridership on the uh, line currently is students. Should we should the county commissioners do the mill levy? That would be our way of subsidizing or, or, or giving the students, you know, kind of a contribution from the community for, the, for their major use of this, of this uh, transportation. It has been very beneficial to those in the community that use that. However, when you look at the reality of the situation, Albany County School District number one has to have 40 to 50 buses to get all their kids to where they need to be at a certain given time. 
we would have to expand the bus system to such a huge uh, number of buses that I don't know that this city could ever afford to do that. But the purpose that it has is great. I would like to see it expanded to West Laramie and the airport. Now that, that may be beyond what they're willing to do in the scope that it is because those that are contributing to this have already determined you know, the route that they're going to initially do. I think we need to go west, not just west and east, but I think we also need to look at north and south also for that. I do support transportation in the city. It, it, it reaches a group of people that have a great need for it. I think that initially when it expands and improves will be driven by gas prices and necessity. All right, thank you. Mr. McCracken. Um, part of the question was um, whether the people in our wards are, being, are benefiting from this. No, it says, uh, do you believe that the current transportation system serves your constituents? And if not, what can you or will you do as city council to optimize okay. services? Well, as far as whether it serves the constituents, that's the people in my ward. And quite frankly, from probably five to ten blocks either side of Grand Gap, it certainly does serve them. It goes to Walmart, it goes to downtown. But expanding it is the answer to getting them to be able to serve the people better. Um, one place where it does serve too is, uh, and this is not the Grand, but they're all kind of, they're getting combined into a single bus system more or less. But where the old Albertsons got torn down, there's 120 cars there during um, the winter. And those people are all being bussed onto the campus. Now those 120 cars are no longer parking within a block or two, so it's taking care of more than just one problem. There's a lot of problems around with parking around campus, and the university has been proactive on trying to get that done, and they've actually gone in a landscape a lot better than I would have ever guess they would have. Um, they, they've done a good job. Um, but as far as supporting it, um, if the voters are willing to support it, I'm definitely willing to support it. Um, we've got you know half a mil. I don't think it's going to be the whole answer by any means. There's probably going to be some grants for either buying additional vehicles or something like that, but um, it really needs to be tied into the university and everybody else. It's not just the county, it's not just us. All right, thank you. Ms. Riley. Um, I agree, there's about maybe 15% of uh, Ward 3 that is being, that is greatly benefits from this particular um, bus service. Um, I'd like to see it expand its bulk wise uh, from to the south lot, which is what uh, Mr. McCracken was talking about. But I also like to see something over here on the west side, and I realize that's not my constituency, but if we're going to expand this and we're going to actually get ridership, that's where we need to be, is on the west side, because that's where our transportation issues quite often are. Um, I worked on campus for many years, and I can tell you our students who live over here really struggle with getting from here to there. Um, so I think that's an important thing. The second piece of that is, is I would like to see some of the, um, as that, as the transportation system spokes out, um, places like I'd like to see it uh, spent, goes out to L triple C in in that particular, in a more consistent kind of basis. Um, they kind of dump them off and off they go and pray that they don't kill themselves walking across that street or in various other kinds of things. I think the system itself is adequate for what we have right now. Um, and I'm going to defer on that bill. <laughs> um, I think that that I think there are other priorities right now in infrastructure that we need to be looking at versus that particular mill. All right, thank you, Mr. Vital. Thank you. Um, I was on a committee uh, must have been a year, two years ago. Uh, that was an ad hoc committee for the uh, Transit Authority, which evolved into the current county uh, committee. I think what you're going to see from this pilot program is the expansion. It's just like a child. It crawls and it walks and then it runs. It's now crawling. Uh, it has a pilot program. It's limited in its route. I think you will eventually see uh, the city divided into geographic areas. There will be a bus that will serve that particular <coughs> geographic area. That bus um, will come into a central location. Um, ones I'm familiar with generally unload in the downtown area. People can get transfers from one bus to another bus and go to different uh, geographic areas uh, to meet their needs. Uh, I think this will come. And I also uh, think that the bike trail, the internal bike trail, will be a part of that program also for bike safety within the city. 
Councilman Hanson, who serves on the National Transportation Board, uh, uh, mentioned to us a couple of weeks ago that there was some increased funding or some funding on the national public transportation um, level. So I, I think we may see funding come from that level as well as whatever referendum or funding strategy that may come up. All right, thank you. And Mr. Blake. Any city that's growing needs public transportation, so I fully support public transportation. And in a city the size of Laramie, it's not so much the size, but we have Wyotech here, we have University of Wyoming here, and we have OCCC here. We have a lot of students that walk. We have a lot of students that ride bikes. Something that's not been brought up, public transportation improves safety. Because the more of those students that you can serve with public transportation, the less you have riding bikes, the less you have walking, the less chance you have of these students, or anybody else for that matter, being hit by another vehicle. I mean, in town, those kind of accidents, I don't see a lot of them, but they do happen. So if we can bring public transportation to West Laramie, as Mr. Shumway said, he stole my thunder there, because I was saying in the airport, it's going to improve safety in town, it's going to give everybody a chance to be able to use the public transportation. The more people it's available to, the more people will write it. As far as that mill grant, as everybody else has said, I will not touch it. Thank you. All right, thanks. Ms. Henry. Um, I really like the idea of public transportation. I have been living in big cities in other places in the United States where I totally depended on it. And it has never been free, though. That's what I think is interesting is why we, how we think we can do this with free bus service. Um, it definitely needs to be expanded. It is not serving Ward 1. Well, it is a little bit in downtown because uh, downtown is in Ward 1. But um, not everybody wants to go to Walmart on a bus and not everybody wants to wait 25 minutes for the bus to then take them to, to Walmart from downtown. So I'd like to see that bus go to West Laramie. I'd like to see it expanded more to the north and to the south. And I wouldn't mind paying to ride the bus either. And you can buy monthly cards, whatever. So I do truly support the public transportation, but it needs to be expanded if I'm going to vote yes on the mill. All right, thank you. Mr. Legendre. Well, public transportation, uh, I think, is kind of a cultural issue here in Wyoming, um, where it's cold nine months of the year, but nobody wants to stand out at a bus stop waiting for a bus. Um, as far as, far as uh, serving my ward, um, about 30% of it, it serves as of right now. Granted, it is a pilot program. Um, public transportation, I think more so, is influenced by necessity. Uh, I was reading an article, and so I can't verify if these facts are accurate or not, but it was saying that 77% of the riders were faculty or students, and that 22% were senior citizens, and 6% were listed as other. So right now, this is kind of a service that's benefiting the university and um, some of the senior citizens in our community. Um, at my place of employment, we have several members that come in that take advantage of the PAT system, and they seem to be utilizing that. I don't know if they're is no crossover in the two systems, but um, if that system's working for them, uh, I don't see why they would go out and utilize the Gem City just from down grand. Uh, as far as funding this, um, I don't see a reason why it can't be self-sufficient and some sort of fee be charged with this. If uh, funding does come in front of the people, I guess they'll decide if they're willing to fund it any further than that. All right. Um, I have four questions here related to aquifer protection, and um, I'm going to start uh, with Ms. Pierce on this question. Actually, I'm going to pull two questions out of this. Um, so first is, what's your position on exercising city authority to control land use in the county to protect the aquifer? What's your position on exercising city authority to protect the aquifer? And then a secondary question is, 
Uh, would you support compensating those who are financially affected to spread the burden equally among the taxpayers? So questions. Can you repeat the first one? Again? So the first one is, what would you? What's your position on exercising city authority to uh, control land use in the county uh, for or for protection? Yeah, I don't really know know the answer to that, nor do I know how to to answer that question. Um, in terms of city authority uh, regarding protecting the aquifer, um, obviously it needs to be protected. Um, in terms of exercising, I, I, you know, maybe it's beyond me. I, I don't know what the city could possibly say to, to the county or, or to the greater, greater area. In terms of, um, I guess I'll stop, stop right there. So what's the second? Okay, the second question. Um, so if the city were to exercise some authority, uh, would you support compensating those who are financially affected? Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, financially, I guess, let me back up. So, so if you're asking, you know, we have the, the water stations, I guess I'll just pass. Um, yeah, so basically the question is if there is, you know, a, uh, this person is saying that this is potentially a taking if the city does something that requires uh, a landowner to uh, put in infrastructure to pay for infrastructure. Eminent domain. Yeah. That's what you're getting to? Well, it's close to it. Yeah. So would you consider uh, compensating? You have to. Right? I mean, if, it, if it's a taking, you have to compensate. Okay. Correct. I'm not an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you compensate at, at value. Mm -hmm. All right. And if you have a little bit more time. Go ahead. Okay. That's fine. Uh, Mr. Shum. Well, obviously, this is a complex but a very important concern and question. First of all, let me start with the city's participation and our interest in this. Uh, last week, Last week, I uh, asked our mayor uh, with other council members to consider uh, expanding our interest, at least have a work session, on what our interests are in protecting the, you know, the uh, water system, the aquifer. We have a, a uh, very, this is our most precious resource, and we have to do everything we can to protect it. Now, right now, we have a one-mile donut around the city limits, for which we have obvious uh, impact that we can we can make decisions that impact them. We do have an option of expanding that donut to five miles for health and safety reasons. Obviously, this is health and safety, and so I am personally interested in doing that, and I will support efforts for us to go out and do that. Now, here's what happens: once we do that, there's there, it doesn't come free. There's going to be a very big expense for this. The city has already taken the initiative of drilling wells to determine the, the levels of nitrates that are getting into our system and we see them being elevated. And that's a concern, that's a big concern because should we have to develop a, a water treatment system to take care of that, the low end is $40 million for us to do this. Now, do we compensate the people that have to hook onto this? I think that that's going to be determined by the courts and by whatever, but I think they need to participate in becoming a part of that system, whether they're annexed or whether they're, they determine to do that on their own. Thank you. Mr. McCracken. Um, okay, at this point in time, um, to control and protect the aquifer, we, right now it's in the county commission's hands. And if we sit there and take too strong a stand one way or another, we will either push them one direction or the other, and I'd like to see what happens first. Um, quite frankly, yes, we can do the one-mile donut. We did part of the one-mile donut. We've already done part of it. We can do a five-mile donut by uh, putting in an emergency. Um, it's been done once with the firework stands back in the 60s or 70s. It's been done. It's, I think it's the only town that's ever done it. The thing is, is that, uh, and yes, we have retested, or we've tested the wells, and there are raised nitrate levels in a few wells. Most of them were very old wells. 
And so now they're supposed to be going back and looking at those wells and checking the seals on the wells. Because some of these things are 1950s properties, because a lot of them were between Vista and Grand. And making sure that there's not a leak going down the well itself down into the water. Um, as far as compensation, if something should happen, we don't have a choice. As soon as the court says it's a taking, we are paid. Whether we're paying through the legislature or trying to, we'll have to go beg for a grant because the city does not have that much at this point in time. We've been quoted, I believe, 35 million to build a water treatment plant on that side of town, and that's not going to help very much. Um, with our water bills by any means, but as far as testing of wells, we, we're, I, I can't sit there, and I'm, and I'm hesitant to give a, I'm very strongly supportive, I'm very strongly supportive of clean water. All right, thank you. <laughs> Ms. Ryan. I think there's more to this issue than just, you know, the, the cursory things that we're talking about here. We recently, in our neighborhood group, dealt with the Casper Aquifer and some other very serious things. Um, the city, yes, does have a one mile donor around, but they've also managed to um, place um, particular areas that um, are not protected. Um, I think there's a, a huge issue um, with the Casper Aquifer. And I think that Mr. McCracken hit the nail on the head. Once that happens, um, if we have to take that property in any way, then we better be looking for some good sized grants um, because it, it's going to be huge. This is a, an extremely complex problem. Um, and I think that some of the science that um, was presented in various development areas has been suspect, to say the least. Um, I think that the nitrates are a real thing. And I think we better be looking at this in a very concrete way. And I think we need to go back and re-evaluate where the science is. I think we have issues. That's pretty obvious. But what we are not doing is, is we have taken some expert testimony and, and we have the city itself has created some buffer zones that um, are unrealistic and untenable. So, that's how I feel about it. All right, thank you. Mr. McCaffrey. Wish I had more than a minute and a half. <laughs> First of all, I think we need to protect the Casper Aquifer from the very people that are trying to protect it. We need to leave the aquifer to the Casper Aquifer Protection Plan the city adopted in 2008. That protects the aquifer. In addition, the city approved the I-80 corridor study two years ago. We've done nothing to implement that. East Laramie drainage study, two years old. We haven't done anything to implement that. Monitoring wells. We have $200,000 uh, to establish monitoring wells. We've done nothing about that. Land purchased around our wellheads to protect the wellheads. That's over two years old. We've done nothing about that. There are things we should be doing that we have been doing, and we don't need to be invading property rights and invading and taking away over 500 people's land and values, property values, uh, and they're the very people that live there that are protecting the aquifer the most. Not one bit of scientific information can show one septic system contributed to contamination there. And there's questions about some of the wellhead testing from a previous water specialist and the method in which they used. Um, nitrate levels, the city had an annual report that's two nitrates per million. That's a city report done by the uh, Water Quality Division of the state. And I could go on and on, but... Uh, All right. Thank you. I know this is a, this is a tough question. Uh, only uh, a minute and a half doesn't allow you to really elaborate. Uh, Mr. Blake, I have been researching this for the past couple months. I've been trying to get through the 314 pages or whatever it is online. <laughs> yes, I have been reading it. And I have not formed a great position on this one yet because I can see a little bit of both sides. I, there needs to be a happy medium somewhere. We do need clean water. There's no doubt about that. We need clean water. But at what cost? At what cost do we need that clean water? 
Now, the stuff that Mr. Patel just, those stats, I had not heard of those. I have not seen those. Like I said, I've been reading through stuff. It, a lot of it comes down to costs, not just for the city, but for the taxpayers. And what's it going to cost everybody? What, how far do we take it before we just say we cannot do it anymore? I will keep researching this subject because I know it is a touchy subject and it is a very important one, but at this time I cannot say more than that. Thank you. Uh, well, you still have a little time, and if you would like to answer the question about compensation, if it was financially affected. We will have to compensate. I firmly believe if, it's finan if they're financially affected, there's got to be some compensation for them. We cannot expect anybody to burden this on their shoulders themselves, so the city would have to step up somewhere and compensate them. How? I don't know. Like I said, I'm still researching this. It is a very touch, touchy subject. All right. Thank you. And Ms. Henry? Um, we've got to protect our aquifer, and I do believe that um, the city of Laramie should extend their one mile donut to the five mile. Um, we should definitely compensate landowners who are affected. And it's too bad that we didn't have the foresight 50 years ago to annex that land in the first place that, because that is where, that's the source of our drinking water. And when we talk about cost, another thing that no one has talked about is what is going to be the cost if we, if that aquifer it becomes contaminated and we can't use it to drink. Where are we going to get our water then? Or we're going to have to build our um, $35 million dollar water treatment center, which then is going to be more. Just like the rec center, when it started out 10 years ago, it was going to be a million dollars to build. And by the time we built it, it was $10 million to build, the very same building. So these costs go up. And we've just got to protect our water. And we've got to, we've got to pay the landowners. We've got to. All right, thank you. And we'll move on to Mr. Lejambre. Well, for the, uh, the first question, absolutely not. And to the people that live outside the city have some say that go of what goes on in the city, um, the city shouldn't have any say of what goes on with them. If the city wants to work with the county and through them come up with a system to address people that live in the county, well, then that's a whole different story. As a person that used to live 0.6 miles outside of city limits, it was very frustrating to see some of the things that went on in the city and have absolutely no say in what goes on with that. Uh, furthermore, as far as the aquifer is concerned, um, we shouldn't have a knee-jerk reaction when, with studies that are still being conducted and go overboard and plan out all these things and put all these restrictions on for something that we don't totally understand at this point anyway. Um, as far as compensating people, if they're being put up financially, um, unless they're out there with a fire hose shooting pesticides and oil just free range out on the ground, then yeah, we, they should be compensated for that. Um, if they're not and they're endangering the aquifer, I'm sure there's a dozen things that they could be charged with and be taken care of that way. So. Uh, no jerk, knee jerk reaction, and so we should work with the uh, county to resolve this problem. Right, thank you. Mr. Muller. Thank you. Well, this aquifer protection is kind of a signature issue for me, and uh, for me, aquifer protection is non negotiable. We live in the arid west. Water is the most basic, most important resource, and most irreplaceable resource that any town has got. In Laramie, we're blessed with a lot of it. We have high quality water. We can't afford to mess it up. Uh, the, the legislature has given each city in Wyoming the authority to extend its territorial jurisdiction to five miles in order to protect health and safety. The legislature has given that to us for a reason. I am willing to let the county commission do their best to have an aquifer protection plan that equals the cities. If they do not, then I will in an instant assert the territorial jurisdiction of the city out to five miles because if they won't protect our aquifer, by gosh, I think the city council ought to because it is our job to make sure that every resident in this city has safe, clean, potable water coming out of their tap. Right now, it takes two days for rain or anything that's spilled on the ground to end up in the city wells. 
And when they get to the city wells, there is no treatment system in place. So you get what is ever in that water. If it's coming out of a septic system, that's getting diluted. I think we ought not to have that in our water supply. One of the things I've really been working on, however, is a win-win situation in which the city could purchase the 11 to 13,000 acres of open land that is for sale out there to protect this open space so we don't have to worry about development on those acres. That's the kind of far-reaching far kind of uh, long-term thinking that I think we need for our future. And in terms of paying the folks that, are, uh, that, that have an, an issue with takings, if there's a finding of takings, I'm all for paying them. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mulder. Mr. Weaver. Thank you. I think it's really unfortunate that such an important issue has become such a divisive issue for the community. I think we have an opportunity at the local government level to do a better job than we uh, occasionally observe at higher levels of government to try to bring in both sides of this uh, extremely um, hot debate and to see if we can come to some kind of a clear and common sense policy that will, will take everybody's concerns into uh, account. As far as exercising the city authority to control the land use, I think that question brings up uh, more questions that we have to have out loud. I mean, do we really know, do we really have the information we need to take that step? Uh, do we have the data? I mean, how rapid is the pace of the nitrate contamination? Um, maybe we need to invest more time before we took that step. Uh, I, would, I would definitely be um, supportive of compensating anyone that was negatively impacted by you know, the potential outcomes of the situation, but I think we need to take a step back here and say, how have we approached this issue? Do we have the information available to make quality public policy that takes both of the uh, viewpoints into consideration? Like a lot of things that deal with environmental issues, we have two sides often questioning the credibility of the other science. So I think we need to have a more comprehensive look at it, take the time if we can, and my impression is that we do have that time, to come up with a good, comprehensive, clear, and fair policy before we start getting into uh, hypotheticals about policy steps that we need to take. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Mr. Brizuela. I think we need to take a deep breath. I think we need to take a deep breath and get centered. Now, ever since I was a little kid, I remember being out in preschool with my friends living out there with the residents. Essentially, it's been residential. Folks have been over that. I don't think we need to, to jump the gun I think it, it's, it's already offering itself up to be a litigation nightmare to, ex, to, ex, to make this step. On the other hand, as much as I believe in American freedom of rights, freedom of the individual, I believe that's essential to a democracy in general. Our water supply is extremely important. We need to protect it. But if we're going to, I, I think taking this step for doing the jurisdiction is going to have bad feelings when all we need to do is take a breath. Septic systems when they are properly installed and used, are very efficient. If we can find, there, I even heard um, alternatives that didn't even involve using septic. Um, if we, if it's just residents, what I, what I see is becoming long-term down the road, is where we have somebody with 20 acres selling it off and building an apartment complex, or building some other huge high risk. So if we just write off carte blanche, okay, fine, you have all your property rights, I believe in rights, but I think it's extremely reasonable to limit growth over the water supply that we need to live on. It is reasonable to limit growth. I don't think we need to kick anyone off the property. I don't think anyone's even proposing that. I don't think that we need to make it this adversarial issue. It's like, look, you have septic systems. It's not. It's it's where the rubber meets the road, man. Where the work is done. Where things are there, man. It's entirely reasonable to compensate people so they can have reasonable septic issues. I think cost sharing is reasonable. All right. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mullen. All right, thank you. This is, this is really a dilemma because it, it, it affects everyone in the city. It affects everyone in the county to the east of the city. And what I want to say is, is that we, as a city, have taken steps. We passed the Aquifer Protection Ordinance. We have the Casper Aquifer Protection Plan. We've had these for, for more than 10 years. And what we've done is we've asked the county to ratify the Aquifer Protection Ordinance that's similar to the city's. I hope that the county does that. I don't know that they will. If they do not do that, 
then at that point, and only at that point, would I consider ever expanding jurisdictional uh, rights for the city. But until until those things occur, I, I don't I don't really I want to leave that to the commissioners to determine. The city has asked them to ratify what the city has adopted, and I believe it's a good plan. I believe it does what it needs to do, and I look forward to working with the county on a number of things. To the second point, I'm going to step back and kind of tell you that, you know, I've got a master's and I've got a doctorate in water. This is what I studied, and I studied it at the University of Wyoming, so I've looked at all of this research. We know right now that the city of Laramie's water is suffering an impact at City Well of nitrates. We don't know where it's coming from. We need to do more research, and we need to look at things. And so I do support continuing to look at these things and moving forward working with the county. Thank you. All right. Um, at this time, I want to make sure uh, that we have enough time for some mingling uh, among the candidates and, and the people here. But there's one question here that I would like to ask, and I'd like our timekeeper to give each candidate 30 seconds to reply to this question. <laughs> and I'll, I'll ask it first, and I'll give you a couple of seconds to mull it over. What improvements do you want to see in your ward? You have 30 seconds to answer that question. So pick one. Uh, and we're going to start with Mr. Blaylock, and we're just going to end with, uh, go around the table and end with Mr. Lutow. Mine goes back to City Park. In West Laramie, we have Park Over by Qantas Park. We have Optimus Park. Kids south of Snowy Range Road have no parks. We need to put a park south of Snowy Range Road for the youth in that community. There's a lot of youth over there, and they have no place to go. They get to play on Colorado Avenue. Colorado Avenue has a wyotech norm to the other in Colorado Avenue. Those wyotech kids fly down that road. We need a safe place for the kids to play on the south side of Snowy Road. Thank you. Ms. Henry. Um, I would like to see the roads in West Laramie paved. I would like to see that. I would also like to see more parks in the area, especially uh, my, my pet peeve is over there in Westfield Village, that the, there are so many houses crammed apartments and townhouses crammed into that area and I, I just had no idea where those kids are expected to play. So that's what I would like to see. Mr. Lujan. Well, like these guys, uh, I'd really like to see all the roads paved over here. That uh, seems to be a big thing. Um, last year, they paved several of those roads, and it's really nice now. I'd like to see that be continued. Um, with all the infighting over the aquifer, um, this is a place for some businesses. Let's make sure that we set up some business infrastructure. <laughs> it's like that. We'll take that <laughs> And uh, in addition to that, I think that uh, it is true that we need to kind of bring all the standards of the roads and streets and, and uh, particularly the storm sewers up to, the, the, up to grade everywhere in town so that there aren't residents that are living in conditions that are they're less than any other resident. I think we can make things more equal. I think we can uh, continue to invest in our downtown to have a vibrant downtown. I think we can continue to invest in having livable neighborhoods and community centers and also uh, protect the historic areas of our city as well. All right, Mr. Weaver. Thank you. I think uh, probably one of the things that I'd really, really like to see, and I think the people at Ward 1 would support it and the other boards as well, is a 24-hour uh, online ability to, play, to pay my utility bills and some of the other permit <laughs> fees and some of the other things. I think that would be something that um, a lot of people would support, and I certainly support it as well. All right. Mr. Brizuela, and I would work too. I would like to see the smiles of happy constituents. That's what I would like to see. I'd like to see I'd like to see us getting together as a community. I'd like to see us all being involved. I would like to see... I think there's... I don't, I don't, I don't want to say anything has been lost, but I think that over the years we've, we've come more into the ideas that we want to build these things, and they just, they just live in ideas and they don't live in the community with us. I don't see the... I, I just, ah, oh, 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. All right. All right. Um, I think one of the biggest things we have to look at, and, and I, I live in the tree area. I've, I've been waiting for a bike trail by my house for 11 years, and I live near Spring Creek. And so I would really like to see us finish the, finish the bike trails. The tree area is very important to me. It's near my heart because I live there. And I really want to see us come up with a plan on how to deal with the trees and you know continue that into the future because that's an incredible asset to this community. Very valuable. And then parks and connectivity, just connectivity in general. So, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Ms. Pierce. I think for me, I'd like to uh, continue our working on our parking situation in Ward Two. I think it's it's tight, it's impossible, and um, we just need to work on that. I think um, residents might need to clear away some of their bushes, so when you actually do get to a stop sign, you can see if cars are coming. <laughs> so, so that's good. Um, a little tree trimming, maybe your bush trimming would be great. All right, Mr. Schumann. Ward 2 is the <clears throat> central part of, of the city. It's a university, it's a tree area, and it's just an absolute defining, beautiful part of the city. I want to preserve that. I also want to make sure that we have cooperation between the university and the residents in parking and also in their facilities. I would love to have that cooperation open and, and free. All right, thank you. Mr. McCracken. Um, Ward 3. Of course, the parks. We, we are short a few parks, but I think that's going to be taken care of. Uh, the road maintenance, uh, there's a few areas that on some of the side roads that aren't what they probably should be, in my opinion. Um, the online payment, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that one a lot. Um, parking is an issue um, down in the campus area, that sort of stuff. And quite frankly, I'm just going to say, as far as once you're in a war on council, you're dealing with all wars. Your idea for a business in West Laramie, let's talk. I'll tell you what the potential is. All right, thank you. Ms. Ryan. Ward 3 is pretty large. It's, it's east of 15th, so I'm going to address two specific issues. The first one is egress, emergency egress. There are, <clears throat> both in Corthell and in Indian Hills, there's one way in and one way out. And if we have an emergency, we are in big trouble. So egress is one of those things I really would like to see. That is 45th in particular. And I realize this is a long-term long -term project. The other issue is drainage in both of those areas. All right. Thank you. Mr. Bartel. Um, Ward 3, I'd, I'd like to see the infrastructure in the older areas brought up to the level of the new areas. Uh, I'd like to see the streets and alleys mm -hmm. improve. Um, because of the, there are three schools in close proximity to Ward 3, I think it's really important that a, uh, an expanded bike path be put into place with kids in that area that will have a safe way to get to the schools or uh, to parks. And I'd also like to see some uh, parkland all right, well, thank you. Uh, before we thank our candidates, uh, we now have, we're going to turn the remaining time over to just uh, mingling, and you get an opportunity to, to speak to your uh, representative or potential representative in your ward. Uh, as we sort of stand up, if you could kind of push your chairs to the back or something, we need to make a little bit of room to make that happen. And now I'd like to uh, give a, a warm uh, thank you to our candidates for spending so much time with us. Thank you.